And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tom Vassell. Lords of Waterdeep, which I'm really afraid of holding sideways like this because I don't want the pieces to fall out. If you notice, it has a neat kind of box. The lid of the box actually comes off like this, and there's more neatness inside. I'm going to show you, but what this is, is I think a first. It's a Dungeons & Dragons Euro game. Really? Let's take a look. So here is the board for Lords of Waterdeep. But before we look at the board, I want to look at the box. This is just a really nice insert. Everything fits in really well. And it has one of those things where I, I like how when the cards are in here, you can push down on them to pull them out. It's really nice. There's a spot for everyone's things. There's a spot for all the different resources and the money. And it just it's a really nice game. Everything is thought of, you know, I want to get one of these discs out. Again, I can just push it and it comes right out. It's pretty neat. Now, you might see here that there are five player colors and each player is going to get a certain number of workers depending on how many people are in the game. You're going to have uh, basically one of the factions like we have the harpers here or you might have the silver stars or the knights of the shield now these factions have no special abilities they're basically just uh, a place that you can put it they're basically just to show what color you are but these are your agents so you're going to have some agents in your agent pool in a four or five player game you'll start with two of them in a three player game you'll have uh, three or four in a two player game uh, and so you have these and you have a tavern. This is where you're going to put people that you're hiring over the course of the game. We got wizards, rogues, clerics, and fighters. That's what these four cubes stand for. And as you get them, you're going to put them in your tavern. And then you have a spot for completed quests. Now, at the beginning of the game, each player is going to get a Lord of Waterdeep. Now, these guys are special people that will essentially, at the end of the game, give you four points for each of specific quests that you solve. So they kind of give you a focus on what to do. And one of them uh, even gives you points for buildings that you have controlled or built during the course of the game. Each round of the game is done in a very specific way. There's victory points down here on top of each of the round turns. So you'll take the three victory point tokens and you're going to put one on each building. And that adds victory points to those buildings when they're built, but also shows you what round number you're on. So you can quickly glance down here to see what round you're on. One player is chosen to go first, and that person's going to be first for the rest of the game, unless someone takes it away from them, which they will. Uh, and then money is handed out, and money is pretty cool money, actually. We got the, the single units, and then uh, five units, uh, which will be used for various things. And then players go. Basically, what players are going to do is they're going to put their guys on one of these spots on the board. And you can see that each spot, each building, these are called, has a spot for one guy. So if I go to Blackstaff Tower, no one else can. If I go to Field of Triumph, no one else can. Although Cliff Watch Inn has three spots. Now most of these spots here are pretty simplistic. You go here, you get two orange cubes or two fighters that you will put in your tavern. You go to Blackstaff Tower, you will get one purple. You go to Castle Waterdeep, you will take the first player marker and you get to draw an Intrigue card. You go over here and you get a, a, a Cleric from the Plinth. You go to Grinning Lion Tavern, you'll get two Rogues. You go down here, you get four dollars in Aura's Realm Shop. Then down here is interesting. When you go to the Builder's Hall, which is a very hotly contested spot to go to, you will pay the cost of a building in dollars. So let's say I want to build this Yawning Portal. Okay, so I pay $4, I get however many victory points are on it, I instantly will get on the victory point track, and then I will build this in one of the building spots on the board. And I will also put a token of my color, which fits really, this is just awesome production values. By the way, this game is stellar, stellar, top of the line, fantastic components, but anyway. You put that there to show that that's your building now. Now anyone can go there, even you. For example, here this gives you two cubes of whatever you want. And you can see that as the buildings have uh, all kinds of neat, cool special effects that you can do that are much better than the regular buildings. Uh, here are one white and two blacks, an orange and black, and two dollars. This keeps having clerics put on it, and if you go there you get all the ones that are put on it. A uh, purple cube and an intrigue card, two oranges and a white, etc. 
So this one's too wild. This is a great building. You get two cubes, anything you want. But if someone else goes there other than you, then the owner will get whatever reward is down there at the bottom. You can see that the, the owner here gets a cube of their choice. Down here, the owner will get a black or a purple cube. This building here, the owner gets an orange or a purple cube. And so owning buildings is great because other people are going to want to use them. Uh, another spot that people can put people is up here at the Cliff Watch Inn. You can go, there's four quests up here. You can go here and I can get $2 in one of these quests, a quest and an intrigue card, or I can wipe all four quests and then put four new ones out and then pick one of those. Now quests is the main focus of the game, so we need to take a look at these quests. There are piles and piles of quests. Each quest has a certain amount, uh, has a certain requirement that needs to be met. So you can see here, for example, this one needs a white, orange, and a black cube. I hate saying that. So this one needs a cleric, a rogue, and a fighter, and four dollars to send aid to the Harpers. If you do that, if after you put someone on the board, you can uh, meet the, the qualifications of this card, then you show everyone that you completed the card and you get a reward. You get 15 points, and then you have to choose an opponent who's going to get four dollars. Uh, and so each of these cards has different ones. For example, this one you need three black, three rogues and two wizards, and you get six points. And you're like, well, that's not very good. Well, this is a plot quest down here, which means you keep it up in front of you, and once per round you can assign a worker to a spot where someone else has a worker. So it gives you special ability too. So some of them are worth more points. I mean, look at this one. It's worth 20 points, and it gives you $2, but you need all those people to send out on it. And so all these different things are in place over the course of the game and each player is going to start with two of them in front of them and as soon as you complete it, you will put it on your upside down, on your completed quests card. Unless, of course, it's a plot one, in which case you leave it face up so you know. And remember, these Lords of Waterdeep will have things to do. Like this person gives you four points for every Arcana and every Piety quest that you do. So. At the end of the game, if these were the four quests I completed, I get four extra points because I completed an Arcana plot. Now, Intrigue cards are something that's very interesting in the game. Intrigue cards are different types. The attack cards will usually go after other players. For example, this makes every opponent take a wizard out of their tavern. But each opponent that can't do that, you're going to get to draw an Intrigue card for. So you can play it in two different ways. You can try to play it to make everyone get rid of a wizard. Or you can play it when no one has wizards to get a whole pile of Intrigue cards. Uh, bidding war then there's utility cards these help you this one lets you draw five quests if there's five players you take one and pass them around uh, there's different utilities and stuff but one of the more annoying intrigue cards that you can play is what's called a mandatory quest a mandatory quest is you play it in front of someone else and you can see that it gives two points to that that player if they play an orange a black uh, I mean a, a fighter a rogue and a wizard and you're like, well, you're giving them points? Yes, but they have to do this quest before they do any of their other quests. The ratio of points to people expended is horrible. So it's a really annoying card to play on someone else. Now, when can you play these cards? Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's when you go to Waterdeep Harbor down here. There's three spots for this. You put one of your people there, and that allows you to play an Intrigue card. That's the only time you can play them. In fact, every card is very, very helpful in this regard because at the bottom here it says, play at Waterdeep Harbor. So you don't forget that. So you go there and you instantly play it. By the way, I should mention that whenever you go to any of these buildings, you instantly get the effect. After everyone has placed everybody, the folks who put their people in Waterdeep Harbor in order will be able to take them and put them in any open spot on the board. So going here lets you play a card and you get to put it in another building. So that's great, except, you know, the buildings that are left aren't probably going to be the best buildings available. After a turn is over, you put out three more points and you keep going on. At the end of the game, whoever has the most points is the winner. You reveal your Lord's of Waterdeep. It's a very, very simple game. More buildings will constantly be coming out. Uh, more victory points and different things. Intrigue cards will be played. And that's it. That's an interesting game with a lot of cool components. Is it good? And the answer is yes. I think this is great. Now, I know it's only March or maybe April by the time this review gets up. But basically... Uh, one quarter of the year is gone at this point, and this is the best game I've played, new game, in 2012. It's not that original. I mean, the putting people in buildings and getting things, I've seen, we've seen that before. In fact, it almost reminds me of a lighter version of Kalos to some degree. It's the same level of complexity as Pillars of the Earth, Stone Age, those styles of games, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's entertaining, it's 
one I think a lot of people will enjoy playing. And the Dungeons & Dragons theme, although it's there, isn't overwhelming. So you say, I hate fantasy. Well, it's not really there that much. It's about as, not pasted on, but about as much as any shipping game. But hey, it's not about shipping. And I know, I see the critics, what? Another dragon? Yeah, but this is completely different, I think. And it's neat, because when you send out the people, it makes sense that you're sending them out on missions, even if they all end up as suicide missions. I have more good things to say, but let's switch to Melody. What do you like? I really like the how that there's a special character for you at the very end, beginning of the game, but you can only use it at the end. Right. Um, and it actually helps you a lot if you're like in last place sometimes. Um, I like making the buildings. It was really cool. Um, and then getting the cube, fighting, like, if you put it there, I'm like, no! And then they're like, okay, and they just put it there anyway. Um, but there's also a special building that lets you go back to it, which also helped a lot. But I like to play it more with more people because it gets more crazy and it's a lot more fun. I'm a little bit of a disagreement here because I played it with three, four, and five players and I think it works equally well with all of them. Four players is probably the easiest of them. Um, I haven't played the two player version yet uh, and I, I don't even know that I would want to but I mean it's there to play. But the three player was really fun and tight and the five player was really fun and tight. And, and in both games uh, we all went over 100 points and the scores were close in all the games I played of this. Uh, the component quality is top notch. Absolutely fa fantastic. Everything just fits. I've already said that a bunch. But it just, and, and the game flows, and it takes about a little over and maybe an hour and a half to play. Uh, I, I just can't say enough good things about it. it. It's very entertaining, lots of choices. The buildings that come up that people can buy are different in every game. And the quests that you get, you'll probably go through the whole deck, but the quests you get are different. So it kind of focuses your strategy and how you're going to move along. It's, it's, it's a good game. So I like it a lot. And you? I wish I had four thumbs. You wish you had four thumbs. All the things you could do. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews, as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find the latest board game news at Dicetowernews.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Fun Again Games, the world's best game source. Fun Again Games has over 5,000 games available. Check them out at funagain.com. <laughs>